All right, here we go. Everybody ready? Hello, Austin. My name is uh, Colin Northway. I made a game called Fantastic Interruption. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Andy Moore. He was instrumental from early on, right from the beginning, as uh, playtesting, and he's now the community manager for Fantastic Interruption. He has also just released his own game called Protonaut that you can find at protonaut.net that uses a lot of the same uh, design philosophies that I used making Contraption. Uh, I just want to get a quick feel on the room. How many people here are from Austin or kind of the, the general area? All right, so like a third or a quarter, so a lot of out-of-towners. Okay, cool. So let's get started. All right, so uh, Fantastic Contraption was, or uh, is a uh, like physics building game. <laughs> Go through a quick introduction. So people make stuff that do things, which is uh, generally a fun thing. And you care about Fantastic Contraption because I made it on my own as an independent developer with no uh, previous professional game development experience and made a boatload of money on it. <laughs> and so... <laughs> And so the idea is all of you can do the same thing, and I'll try to uh, keep you up to date with what I learned, and then you can take away what of that sounds sensible and use it yourself. These are just some uh, quick contraptions that people uh, have built and I'm sharing with you. Sharing is a big part of Fantastic Contraption, and I'll talk about that a little bit later and how that's critically important to the success of the game. Uh, people make all sorts of things, and some of them are uh, amazingly epic. This is probably the most epic thing I've ever seen anyone make in Fantastic Contraption. So some of the most important parts of uh, Fantastic Contraption is the less is more design philosophy. So build your game by taking stuff out, not by putting stuff in. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, the pride-based marketing, which is people push your game around because they want to feel good about themselves. Flash itself as a platform for making games and the strategies I use to monetize it. And so uh, in terms of, mon I want to talk a little bit about uh, monetization strategies in Flash. So in Flash, you all know there's uh, kind of a culture of everything should be free. And if you're charging money for it, then maybe there's something a little bit wrong with you. Or maybe it's a little bit immoral. So obviously, as uh, professional and uh, hopeful professional game developers, you have to get that out of your head. And charging money for things isn't immoral, uh, especially if you spent a lot of work making it. And people will buy it, and uh, they, won't, uh, they won't call you out for doing the sensible thing. <laughs> yeah, completely epic. Totally amazing. All right, so Fantastic Contraption, if you want to understand the design of Fantastic Contraption, you have to understand the games that came before Fantastic Contraption. Uh, it is, a, a, in a larger... Uh, it's a, basically a response to games I played previously. Fantastic games that uh, all, you should go, all go out and play right now if you haven't played them before. And uh, the most hands-down important game in the development of Fantastic Contraption is Peter Stock's Armadillo Run, which if you haven't played Armadillo Run, you should go give him $20 and play it because it's one of the best games I think ever made. Armadillo Run itself is a response to Bridge Builder. If you haven't played Armadillo Run, it's kind of like... Uh, bridge builder with an armadillo. And so that means that it's, it's kind of like uh, the incredible machine where you have a basketball <coughs> and your goal is to get the basketball from uh, point A to point B, maybe down a basketball net. And so in, in the incredible machine, an armadillo run, the idea is you take a dumb basketball and then you build a smart environment and then the basketball enters the smart environment, which goes through contortions and flips and rockets, and then pushes the very dumb basketball into the hoop. And so the basic conceit that is Fantastic Contraption is that you are a smart basketball. So in this case, I am the embodiment of my own game. So it's the incredible machine where you make a basketball that goes from A to B, instead of making an environment that gets the basketball from A to B. And so really, the design is driven by uh, four major things. So the thesis, that smart basketball, is, what is your touchstone for all decision-making. So uh, this, oh no, you broke it. <laughs> it's a, the, is, it might be a little buggy, it hasn't gone through a lot of playtesting. So this is, uh, that's, awesome. that's awesome too. So this is the, uh, this is 
the birth of Fantastic Contraption. I woke up in the middle of the night and said, oh my god, I have a fantastic game idea. It is, then I wrote down this. And if you can't read my writing, it says, cool shit idea, colon, presented with arenas, have to make a guy that can cross them. And so in the design... <laughs> and so in, in the design of the game, that is the most important thing. That That is the goal I'm trying to work, work towards. Uh... <clears throat> Uh, the design philosophy I used is always less is more. So you want to get across that thesis with as little information as possible. Let people be as creative as they as possible, but with as few tools and as simplistic game as practically possible. Um, uh, the way I did de- development and design was extremely iterative. So th- when I started making Fantastic Contraption, I had the idea in my head. It's kind of like when you were... 10 years old, and you were thinking, oh, I can totally draw a dragon. I know what a dragon looks like. And then you go down to actually draw the dragon, and you realize you have no idea how to draw a dragon. Like, you think you see it all in your head, but when you go down to actually do it, none of it is there. And so with uh, Fantastic Contraption, and uh, I know some other indies, some very successful indie games have been made in the same way, you just embrace that. Embrace, embrace the not knowing, not knowing what a dragon looks like. Just start putting your pa- paper to pencil and start drawing and see what comes out. Bits of it are going to look like crap, and so the most imp- the the fourth most important thing that drove development and design was beta testers. And so put what you have in front of people, see what they like about it, see what they don't like about it. Like gut check everything yourself, but make sure you get it in front of real people who you know don't love to death everything you do, like you probably do. All right, so this is actually the first version of Fantastic Contraption. <coughs> And so you can see right away, this was like day two of development or something. And so you can see right away, it's a playable game. There's no, uh, I didn't sit down and and make a bunch of construct and make the game look like I thought it was going to look eventually. I just sat down and made it as simple as it could possibly be. And so from that, you learn instructive things. You learn the basic idea that going from A to B is a fun thing to do and that building little little guys that whirl around is a fun thing to do. So you right away, you validate a lot of your decisions. So squish a few more bugs, and we get to version 2. Version 2 has is uh, basically just a goal and some slightly refined building tools. So the goal is, uh, it's it's not obvious that how the goal is to be constructed. So if you want to make a guy, uh, then you have to have some way of limiting the, the people, so they have to make a guy and not an armadillo run level. So starting at the beginning and then working away to the end is an obvious way to do that. You can see very early versions of wheels in this, which um, play test not very well at all. The wheels were uh, not very useful in terms of actually moving across the environment. So that obviously needs to be iterated on. And so next version. So this is the version that actually went out to the kind of small net of, uh, well, the slightly wider net of beta testers. So all these previous versions have kind of been played with Andy, who was instrumental from very early on, and me and my wife. This version actually went out to uh, family and friends. And so you can see in this version, we have the flux capacitor of Fantastic Contraption, which is the wheels with uh, joints on them. Wheels with joints on them let you build... uh, all sorts of complicated things, but with extremely simple tools. So you can see Andy can make a, uh, a odd flailing contraption with the same tools that he uses to build a walking contraption. So I have no great ideas on how to, com- on how to come up with your own flux capacitor. Uh, hanging a portrait on your, while standing on your toilet might help. But uh, that's the spark that makes uh, game design fantastic. All right, jumped, uh, squished a couple more bugs. Move on to the next version. Oh, that's not good. <laughs> All right, so this level has the level editor in it, which is good. And so, oh, wait, let's go back. Uh, sorry, sorry, Andy. Let's go back to, um, there was a few uh, examples that aren't actually in the game itself the, of early beta testers playing that first level. And so these are, the, these are the first contraptions ever built. They're the first solutions to the first levels. 
And so these are instructive because at this point, I don't know what it actually means to beat a fantastic contraption level. So you don't know if uh, you have to get the entire thing from A to B <coughs> or just a part of the thing from A to B or how big or how small that might be. And so I'm a big fan of, that was my, that's, that was my dad's and it was one of my favorite solutions to anything. <laughs> and so this is incredibly instructive because I am a big believer in, in terms of end goals and motivating players, I love to give people a sandbox or give people a toy and then see how they beat it. What do they think is fair? So obviously, uh, in those levels, it wasn't fair to make people take, build a thing and then walk all the way from left to right and not leave anything behind. People, that's not how they naturally played the game. If they picked it up and started playing, that's not how they did it. So when I went to formalize the win condition, when now we can jump onto this one. When I went to formalize the win condition, now I wanted to make sure that that mantis creature could succeed as well as a car could succeed. And so the, uh, the, in retrospect, obvious solution of adding a basketball, which is just, oh, you need a basketball to win, of adding a basketball just to get from point A to point B becomes a solution, which is great. It's great when the like, obvious thing is the correct answer, but sometimes you have to take a little while to get there. So other things I learned by doing, working this incredibly iterative strategy um, was that sometimes you just don't need to implement things, and that's the best way to implement them. So at some point, I assumed that there was going to be... So if you've played Ar Armadillo Run or Bridge Builder, you'll know that everything comes in, in set length pieces, so you can't make a huge, long... <coughs> you can't make a huge, long girder in Bridge Builder, because if you could make a girder that was as long as the span you were trying to span, it would be a trivial game. So in Fantastic Contraption, I had fully assumed to build, in my vision at the beginning, I fully assumed I would have these limited spans. But in doing playtesting and just playing with it before that was ever implemented, you discover that the limited spans is actually a solution to a problem that Fantastic Contraption doesn't have. So Fantastic Contraption solves that, the problem of, like, long, of, uh, long spans being trivial solutions by having the uh, limited build area which is fantastic. I love it when the solution to a problem is uh, don't solve it. All right, and then I think we can move on to the next one. Oh, is this the next one? Oh, sorry. And so uh, I wanted to <coughs> talk a little bit about a solution that I never found, a solution to a problem <coughs> that I never managed to found. Sorry. I had, uh, I'm recovering from Pax Pox, and I'm not contagious anymore, but I still have this lingering cold. So this presentation is uh, Fantastic Contraption Postmortem, Colin versus the uh, hacking cough. And so I wanted to talk about a solution to a problem that I, uh, that I didn't manage to solve. So simpler is always better. And so if you build, so say you have um, two rods. You have two like rods in, we assume, like three-dimensional space, they are, have mass, and they're solid, and they cross each other. So if you built... So what happens when you have two rods that... Or if you take two solid rods and cross them? What happens when you take two solid rods and cross them in real life? Well, um, nothing good happens. And in fact, in Fantastic Contraption Now, you can't do this. It just gives you a big X over the screen when you try to do that, which is uh, bad because it's more complicated for the user. If the user, cater, user can just build whatever the hell they want, then that's awesome. They don't have to, you don't have to instruct them that stuff can't cross each other as long as something sensible happens. And in this version, something sensible happens. That's great. They fuse together, so they become one girder. So that's a perfectly uh, great solution to the problem of girding girders and wheels crossing each other. Unfortunately, it ends up, it gives you... <laughs> this version is also quite broken. Unfortunately, it leads to degenerate play solutions to things. If you could make arbitrary girders that are perfectly strong or not perfectly strong, you can make basically any shape you want, and the game becomes too easy. So, in unfortunately, sometimes... Yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately, sometimes gameplay trumps simplicity, and this is one of those cases. I wanted to show you something I tried that didn't make it into the final version. All right, so here is the uh, audience participation test part. So this is the like, final version. It's the version that's like online right now. 
And he's going to build us up a little, uh, a little contraption. It doesn't involve that. All right, so watch what he does. And then tell me how you think this thing's going to react. All right, so there's a wooden rod and there's a water rod in the middle of a wheel. So who, who, who thinks they can predict what is about to happen when he hits go? What do you think? So you think they're both going to swing down? All right. Any other guesses? You think it's going to walk? And so I think sensible things to happen here would be for both the rods to swing down or both the rods to swing around in a circle. But what actually happens, and this is in the like, production version of Nancy's contraption, is one, an arbitrary one of the rods spins, and the other one does not. And so if the user, you as an audience, could not, basically couldn't have gotten that question right, which is, of course, why I asked it, because you have no way of knowing which arbitrary rod is actually connected to the middle of that wheel. So this is obviously, like, as a game designer, a horrible thing to have in your game, because it means it's basically non-deterministic to the user. <coughs> And so I worked, this was the single biggest problem I worked on through development, was trying to find a model for this that worked the way people, in a sensible way physically in the real world, and also worked to a way people would expect it to work. And so I'm not going to talk too much about um, the different techniques I tried, because it's incredibly involved and kind of complicated, and it would take me forever to uh, try to explain it to you. But <clears throat> suffice to say... <clears throat> every other solution, every sensible solution that has something deterministic happen here is worse in some other way. And uh, I think the biggest fundamental design thing I learned about fant uh, while doing Fantastic Contraption is uh, why this works, why nobody ever complains about this, why nobody ever notices that something bad is happening. And that's because uh, people don't, people don't, Put, people don't use wheels to spin rods. People don't look at this uh, at like the wheel with the little arrow on it and think, "Awesome, I'm going to make a clock out of that." People use rods to spin wheels. There are cars in our world, and there are things in our world things spin around on wheels. And so, uh, what took me forever to figure out was that it's fine that uh, that's broken because what's important is that every time. Every time, every contraption people will actually build in the real world works to their mental model. So your mental model of how fantastic contraption should work and how this should work is, has like nothing to do with reality, which means it's impossible for me to code something that will work in all cases like the user wants it to work because users do not have that detailed conception of the world. So instead, what you can do, and what I think is fantastic, is you can write to the model, the mental model of the world, instead of how the world actually works. So uh, because, so like uh, double jumping, right? Like it seems like you should be able to double jump. Like it just kind of feels like you should be able to double jump. But you can't. It's obviously totally impossible. I'm sure like almost everyone in this room has tried, would try to double jump when they were a kid. And like wall running, wall running seems like it should make sense, but I'm sure we all tried that when we were 10, and I could never like wall run any, on like over any kind of distance. And so that doesn't matter. It works in a game because it fits your mental model. It feels what seems like should be right. And so designing to what seems like should be right instead of what's actually physically right is uh, an incredibly valuable tool to have in your belt. All right, and then I want to talk about uh, the tutorial. So the first tutorial, oh, I love it. It throws an error every time we load it up. And so the very first tutorial was fantastic. Everyone in this room would have loved it. I got you starting, <coughs> got you into the game in no time flat, and it lost every single non-gamer person I put in front of it utterly. So the thing about us, everyone in this room, and gamers, is that we like to toy with stuff. We like to play with interfaces, and we like to fail and then try again and just test stuff out. Which is, fan which is great, which is a like, really fun way to learn how to play a game. The thing about non-gamers is they hate doing that. They are scared witless about hitting a button and then having like, the world as we know it end. It's like every, every single button click is life and death. And so if you don't tell them what a button does, it very explicitly, they just won't hit it. So this... 
Uh, me versus the hacking cough. So this is incredibly, uh, this is instructive of how valuable that user testing is in all stages, especially at these late stages where you're testing usability in your tutorial. Talking about writing Flash games, <coughs> uh, when people start a Flash game, the reason you're going to get so many users <coughs> is because there is very little barrier to try it. Even with a download game, there's like 30 seconds of downloading the game and then starting it, which is like great. I'm sure everyone here like loves download games. That's where like almost all the interesting gameplay is going on right now. But the average user just doesn't want to take on the chance of losing that 30 seconds. And so if you, in Flash, they don't, they don't see any, any risk inherent. But because there's no risk, there's no time invested, they have no time to lose if they just leave. Like, Mirror's Edge can be horribly complicated because somebody spent $60 on it. And if you spent $60 on something, you were going to figure out, like, what the hell you just bought and how to, like, get from here to there. But if all people have invested is 10 seconds of, like, clicking on a link, you have to bring them through to the game as quickly as possible with as little confusion as possible. This is, like, the most important difference in writing a game for in Flash and versus download or something else. You have, like... No grace from these people. They, they, have, they don't love your game. They don't know who the hell you are. They just want it to work and work the first time and be fun immediately. So you have to try to do that as quickly as well as you can. And the only way you can do that is to take the people who like, hate you and put them in front of your game and then write it specifically for them. So what most people would do would be uh, this, which is incorrect. There's an example just above them, if you zoom out a little bit that clearly shows that that is incorrect, that what they have just done is totally wrong. And there's tools to correct this. There's, a, there's like a delete button, and there's a delete hotkey, and they can just like draw it again. <coughs> but instead, they do what the uh, instructions tell them, which is like draw a branch between the two wheels. They think, done, awesome. I got that horrible experience out of the way. And then they hit uh, go, and then nothing happens, and they immediately quit the game. And so the improved tutorial... <coughs> Almost finished this level. So the improved tutorial is completely awful. And it's like every other tutorial that you've ever played. It's the uh, like awful, oh god, I know I have to click on that thing. Stop giving me pop-up boxes. I'm going to murder you if you don't just let me play the game soon. But uh, through, uh, through playtesting, it's really quickly becomes clear that the only way you're going to get the average kind of person with a computer to play your game is to just spoon feed them the first five minutes. And so if this now, if you try to do that, it just says, no, you fail, try again. No, get it right. Until finally you're rewarded with your thing actually doing something. <laughs> All right. <coughs> so here at the very end, when he's so close, I actually want to, no, oh. All right, you weren't supposed to do that yet. All right, so I want to talk a little about uh, living online. Actually, bring up, bring up those old solutions. Cycle through those a little bit. So another instructive thing about that first round of beta of uh, playtesters is that I have these solutions, right? So, so, so like, uh, my dad started playing my game because I sent it to him, and, like, my brother started playing my game. And right away, they started making movies and, like, passing. They wanted to show me the stuff they had made. And so... I am this, I'm a huge believer in this idea that however people play your game, you just want to let them do that like more. Reward people for what they already want to do because they know how to have fun already. And so <clears throat> it became immediately clear that people are really keen on sharing something that they've built and they think is cool. So building that into the game it became a no-brainer. Went through different iterations, started with like XML cut and paste, you know, just to like try stuff out until I ended up with, uh, eventually, we can't really, uh, I don't think we're really tied to the internet right now, so I don't think we can really show you a save. Can you? No. So, um, but net. Yeah, I think we're just too lazy to hook that up. So, hopefully, if you haven't played, it's easy to explain. You make a thing. It's awesome. You decide, you decide I'm going to show that to all my friends. Whenever you finish a level, you're prompted with, like, a, do you want to save? You type in a name. You type in a description, you hit save, and then uh, you're, instead of working forever, my error handling code is still really, really bad. Instead of just working forever, you're pr prompted with uh, a little URL. So the, kind of the, the 
most basic atomic tool of the internet, the URL, is uh, how you can share your thing. And so it just says fantastic contraption com question mark design ID twelve thirty six. So I like that a lot more than the more common approach, which is to encode the entirety of your construction inside a URL. So you have like the you have like um, uh, like linewriter dot com slash question mark and then you know like twenty pages of text for that like awesome line writer thing you built. So there's downsides to putting your thing in the database like I did, but there's also big upsides. So one, that link, that little URL is so much easier to pass around than ten pages or ten lines <coughs> of uh, of save code that encodes your entire thing. The downside uh, is of course that you have to actually run the database which is a non-trivial thing in terms of actually running the database. But in terms of writing the code, in terms of like actually doing the web development, it is not a hard thing. And no one here should be afraid of that. I've talked to people who are like, yeah, I would totally save it in the database, but I'm not a web developer, and I don't know how all this stuff works. The save code for... Uh, oh, that's kind of cool. The save code uh, on the server... The server code for saving a contraption is like 10 lines long. It's, it's a non-issue. The only thing, b- thing between you and a game that saves stuff on the server is like the will to do it and an afternoon. It's really not very much work. And the XML handling stuff in Flash is awesome. It's all really easy. All right. So that's, uh, yeah. And so after you do that, you get these links end up all over the Internet. They end up everywhere. They end up in people's like messenger. They end up in emails. They end up in forums are, are critical. So Fantastic Contraption passes itself really well on forums because uh, someone will find the game and think, oh, okay, this is cool. I got this like neat thing. So here's this game I'm playing, and here's you know my neat thing I built. But I can't really beat level four. And then someone else will go, oh, man, that's a neat thing, and uh, here's how I beat level four. And so they'll, you'll, it's like a forum game. People will play your game in their community, and so you don't have to write like Facebook tie-in and stuff. It, wherever a community exists online, people can play your game. And people will gleefully play your game amongst themselves. Because that's, I mean, the most fun way of playing games is communally. And so I, uh, so I call that pride-based marketing. Because whenever you make something, you want to pass it on. That's just human nature. And so if you, can, if you have a game that works with that, the, the people build stuff, like um, uh, we saw like Captain Forever earlier, that's, that pride-based stuff in that is going to be awesome. Because you make a ship, and you want to pass your ship around to other people and let them see how cool it is. So if you have a game that like lends itself to that, do everything you can do to make that as easy as possible. Like now you might do, you might like automate the Facebook stuff or like send, make it easy to send a Twitter off so like everyone you know can see this, this like cool thing you made in your game. And it is, will pay off so well for you and the way your game spreads. All right, let's move on to the next one. All right, so right, development. And so uh, I just want to talk really briefly about my, uh, like, API and how I develop. (coughs) So don't be afraid of Flash. Flash is really easy. Uh, Forget this whole, like, timeline and all, like, wizzy woog and all of that. Just totally ignore it. Fantastic Contraption was written, like, totally from the beginning in the command line compiler and, like, a text editor. So just like you write any other games in C or whatever, you will write them the same in Flash. You'll just spend uh, less time to do it because Flash has, you know, nice... Uh, like sprite interface and stuff built in that uh, me- takes a lot of your work away. In fact, uh, I think Flash and the combination of Flash and Box CD saved me so much time that if you watch Andy squishing bugs back there, that with Flash and Box 2D, you go to this squishing bugs. <laughs> it just becomes so much faster, and your game gets finished much more quickly. Uh, my yeah, get that guy. So my, uh, my watchword for that is I like to make games and not tools for games. So obviously, like, uh, if you can find someone that does a library for you, definitely use it. Write games, release games. Don't, make, don't get like, boiled down and bogged down in tools and stuff. All right, and then the, uh, the, last, the last hurrah of actually making a game, the release into the wild, or the horrible crush of people in the case of Fantastic Contraption. So this is one of those uh, good problems to have people tell you about. Good problems to have are not good problems to have. All problems are bad. (laughs) 
And so for me, the horrible crush of people was bad for a number of reasons. My server exploded hopelessly, hopelessly exploded. And it took three months to get on top of that, moving from server to server, watching the database traffic be faster and kill me. And another problem is um, <coughs> the forums and the extended community, which is obviously, it's like a game, game that lives online. Very, like All of that stuff is uh, very, very quickly developed. And all these people uh, had great suggestions and things that were broken and bugs and ideas, and all of this stuff was fantastic. It was great. But I found it amazingly hard to interact with them. They just crushed me and buried me. And uh, so I found what I... Yeah, especially because now there's these like forums after you make a game, and all these people either really hate you or really love you, even though they have never met you or have any idea who you are. And so actually trying to like go on there and interact with them is, is this emotional roller coaster that I was just not real keen on. So the only person um, that I paid like any like contraption ever hired, if you want, is uh, Andy Moore, my community manager. <laughs> Get them off me, Andy. Save me. <laughs> From the horrible crush of people. Yeah, so uh, Andy is a community manager. It's fantastic. <laughs> All right. Andy is a community manager is like as of a god to me. Because it means that I get to worry about actually fixing things instead of like how, you know, people don't like this thing that I did this like forum post that I wrote on like my dog or something, which is kind of what I would always end up intrigued with if I was in there trying to do it myself. Okay, let's try to move on. <laughs> All right, so here is my, to show, try to show you some hard numbers, here is my Google Analytics for the first week. <laughs> Got to get these guys off me. So uh, everyone's going to tell you, all the indie guys are going to tell you that step one is make a game, and step two is make people play your game, and that you have to work your ass off and uh, talk to press and <coughs> get your game around and uh, write lots of emails. And so for me, it was totally exactly the opposite. I was just lazy and sat on my couch after a soft launch to work out some of the bugs, and then the next weekend there were 20,000 people playing the game. And so uh, this... Uh, meteoric rise is thanked mostly to the internet, and this is why I like Flash, and uh, this is why I like Flash more than I like download games, and this is why I like the internet as a distribution model more than I like uh, like XBLA or something, because on the internet, there people have solved this content discovery problem. It is a non-issue. People dis find discover content in a huge myriad of ways. There are tons of ways people use to find games, from like forums to like emails and everything. Where every other distribution channel, like the iPhone, everybody knows, right? The iPhone's content discovery problem is massive, and that finding games that aren't like the top 100 games, the best 100 games, is like amazingly hard. So making money on the iPhone is hard to do if Apple doesn't just like spray the money hose at you. But other other platforms have the same problem. Whereas on the internet, if your game reaches an audience, and uh, that audience can like happily share with each other, <coughs> the internet can just do its thing, and you don't really have to worry about it that much. I shouldn't say that, because like everyone, like everyone says, you should work really hard and like get your game out there. But it's a way better pro problem. It's a way, uh, the problem has been solved much better than like everywhere else in the game world. All right, so yeah, after week one, <laughs> All right, so this is the first month, and so traffic just continues to go well. And so at this point, money is actually coming in, which feels, uh, it's an amazingly emotional thing to have people pay you money. So I had, like, uh, uh, my pay, it, the only way to buy a fantasy contraption is PayPal. And my PayPal account was hooked up to my Gmail account, like my everyday Gmail account. <coughs> and so whenever anybody paid me, I'd be, like, sitting at work, my old, like, web development job, because I wrote this whole game, like, part-time. And there's this little like thing would pop up that was like, bink, some human being thinks you deserve ten dollars. <laughs> and so that's like a crazy thing to be happening while you're like sitting hacking on this like banking bank website of corporate monotony. And like, bink, someone thinks this little thing you made is worth ten dollars. It's like Oh no! What did you do? 
How did you do that? Oh, this is the importance of user testing. Okay. Sorry about that. You can get back. You can get back. Yeah, so, this, uh, so at this point, <coughs> money is starting to come in, which is uh, fantastic. And then eventually enough of it comes in that it's paying me more than my real job, and I don't have to do that anymore. And now I make games for a living, which is great. But I think one of the most important things about the way you ask for money in a Flash game, like one of the Mochi guys drew this distinction between a Flash game and a game written in Flash, which I think is like an important distinction because Flash games are like kind of suck games where you launch kitties like at spiked things, and then a game written in Flash can be really good, but also have like zero download um, bar and like a, millions of people will play it instead of four. All right, good stuff. <coughs> And so, uh, one, but one of the important things when you do monetize a Flash game, and I'm not going to pretend to have all the answers here because I know people who have tried the same thing and it didn't work out as well, and people who are trying other things and those are working out very well. But one thing that I think I learned was that you don't want to have a pay game. Like, Fantastic Contraption asks for money, but it's not a pay game. When I get reviewed on review sites, it's always Fantastic Contraption. It's this great free game. I think there might be some other stuff you get if you pay him $10, but that's not really important. Be reviewed as a free game. Give away a ton of content. I think there's like 10 hours or some huge amount of free gameplay in Fantastic Contraption. And if you do that, then more people will play it. And that's, like, I think, like, I have no evidence to back this up, but I think what you really want is for just more people to play your game. You know those piracy numbers where, like, 99% of people pirate stuff? I think that's... Also true of like games like this. Even if you give people away things, 99% of them will take it for free. But what's more important in this piracy numbers is that 1% of people will actually pay you for something. And so focus on that 1% and kind of forget the other 99 as people who you're just going to have to like give bandwidth to to get to the 1% that actually will give you money. And so I'm dubious that if I had a paywall earlier, I would have many more people give me money. So this is why I have nothing to back this up, but I think it's probably true. And so uh, always get reviewed as a free game. Um, just to talk about, wow. <coughs> just talk about what my numbers are. For every uh, one person that visits the site, no matter like if they spend two seconds on it or run away right away, I convert about 0.5% of them to the pay version. So, I mean, understand that that's, it sounds, it sounds not great. It's the same kind of numbers that, like, download guys and, uh, like, Big Fish aim for. They aim for kind of the 1% mark. I think this 1% mark is some kind of magic 1% of people are not assholes and actually give you money for things they play. And so uh, I think going, just appeasing as many people as you can and then give that 1% a way to give you money is the way to do things. Um, caveat, don't ask for donations because even that 1% are assholes when it comes to donations. I know it's like I've watched some fantastic games ask merely for donations, and it rarely goes very well at all. You have to give people a tote bag. In Fantastic Contraption, it's the level editor and the ability to play more levels. Most, what, did you say what percentage of people actually make a level with the level editor? Like 5% of people who buy the game use the level editor and like save a level. That's crazy. Out of 0.5% who play, uh, that buy it, 5% actually use the thing. So it's not, I mean, they, uh, they do get um, the other user, 40,000 user-made levels, which is great. But what's important here is that you just give them, like, a thing when they buy it. Like, you just want that, uh, that tote bag, you know? So you're really paying, when people buy your thing, they're really paying for, like, the nine hours of Red Dwarf they just watched. But when they actually pick up the phone, they go, I could use a tote bag. I go grocery shopping. I'll totally use that. So give them something like a level editor that's like, yeah, I'm going to become a content creator. That's going to be good for me and good for everyone else. That's going to be great. And then they just never will, which is fine because you've, you've got their money and everybody leaves happy. All right. What's the last thing I want to say about? Yeah, okay. So I just want to like refresh that idea of like living on the Internet. If you have a game, <coughs> then you should write it in Flash because then way more people will play it. And if you write a game in Flash, then you should make that sucker live on the Internet. Because don't just make it like a game that people download and play and throw away, like you know most games are. But if you make that sucker really live on the Internet, you can do all the wonderful things that the Internet does. Like help people like share with each other and all, like, <coughs> sorry. Oh. 
and you can have like big communities that go places and people can meet each other. If you have just a game that like exists, then that's like that's awesome and people will play it and people will find it. But you have if you have a game that kind of leverages the power of the internet somehow, like the greatest invention of like all mankind, then that's like way better. So I would highly suggest making a game in Flash because more people will play it, and then making it like live online and using taking advantage of that as much as you possibly can. And uh, yeah, so that's the last that's the last three months. I can't show after this because like uh, I ended up selling the right to like run the game to a company called In Exile in Southern California, who are really good at what they do, and so the numbers after this are like theirs and mine. So I just wanted to show off that like. It's a nice, you know, it's a nice flat curve. You can kind of guess what happened from here. It didn't like drop through the floor. Things were pretty happy. There was like a lot of money made, and uh, that spike is like Reddit. All of those like aggregator sites are fantastic. I think the number one source of traffic after like those save links and uh, Google traffic were Jay's Games. Thank you so much, Jay's Games, for giving us so much traffic. And then the second one from that was StumbleUpon. Actually, no, StumbleUpon and then Jay's Games. Because StumbleUpon kind of made us and then also just kept giving us traffic, like, forever. And I think that's all I wanted to say. And I'll uh, manage to leave 15 minutes for questions, so that's good. <laughs> so anyone that has a question, feel free to ask it now. <laughs> question. How did you find Andy to do your community stuff? Uh, I was best man at his wedding. Oh, sorry. The question was, uh, how did I find Andy to do community management? And the answer was, uh, I was best man at his wedding. But um, Andy's really good at what he does. If you're looking for someone like Andy, just find Andy. Uh, what's, your, what's your email address? Or what's your website? Yeah, just go like andy at andymore.ca. That's A-N-D-Y-M-O-O-R-E dot C-A. And he's extremely good at what he does. And I think it's an extremely valuable service. Any other questions? You, sir. Uh, what did you decide to hook up with Ah. Ah, so the question was, why did I decide to uh, hook up with an exile? So, um, <coughs> one, an exile has experience with, like, running servers, because they also have a uh, line writer. And so running servers turned out to be the worst part of this entire thing. When I actually think back like emotionally about Fantastic Contraption development and everything, I kind of think, yeah, I miss like every weekend for four months, did a lot of work, and then like people yelled at me about server problems for a further three months. Like that's emotionally what I remember. It was so awful. Uh, don't, don't not do it because it's going to be awful. Just have a plan. I have somewhere to upgrade to. As long as you have somewhere to upgrade to, you'll be fine. Have a trigger to pull on like always have something bigger. And then uh, the other thing that they do for Contraption is um, they do the iPhone version, which they did a crazy good job on, and uh, as well as um, probably by the end of the year, there's going to be a little more to the uh, online Contraption universe, which will be is looking pretty cool. And then basically, after spending four months of my uh, like you know close encounters where the guy is uh, like building the mushroom or the mashed potato mountain, and he ends up becoming all obsessed with building that mountain. That was kind of like fantastic contraption for me for four months. So after building my like giant mashed potato mountain, I have no real interest in like going back to it and fixing it. Or you should bring up bring up contraption. Just if you want to see some of the atrocious stuff that I never took out and I never fixed in contraption. Go to, uh, oh, can you, oh, we can't bring up this. Can you go to My Designs? Yeah, that'll never come up. Well, that's one, for instance, non-existent error handling. What? Who does that? What if the server's not responding? The server's always not responding. It doesn't make any sense to not handle that error gracefully, but I don't. And if you, uh, if you go home and look at, like, the My Designs and the player levels and the... Yeah, none of that stuff's going to load. But it still has my... That's the only place my art is still in the game. So my wife, um, <coughs> Sarah, did all of the art. She did a fantastic job, obviously. I highly recommend the like best way to get art in your game is to marry an artist. But, uh, yeah, so those like kind of tertiary menus are the only place where my art is still in the game. And there's no way it should be there. And I know it. I should have like gotten it out at some point. But uh, after spending four months on something, it was just... I am not keen to ever kind of touch it again. And so... And Exile will go on to like do the stuff that everybody knows and everybody agrees should be done, and I don't have to actually write the code. I can work on like a new fun thing instead. 
Question. Yes. Yes. The explode. Don't do that. Don't show people how to do that. <laughs> right. So the exploding bug is not intentional, and uh, I would love to have that not in the game. Please God, anymore. I made. If I make physics updates to the games, then uh, it breaks all the old replays. Unless I add like you know a hack to use the old replays onto the old physics, which I'm too lazy to do. And so I did all of two physics updates, like ever, very early on, and because it killed all the replays in the game. And one of those was to make it harder to make exploding contraptions. I totally forgot at some point to do the like big shout out to Aaron Cato who wrote Box Two. Let's all applaud for Aaron Cato. And like the whole Box 2D team, because those guys are totally amazing. I was uh, when you do make some money, make sure you funnel money back into like all of those open source projects you used. I gave Aaron Cato and those guys a bunch of money at the end of every month, as well as the guys that ported the uh, Box 2D to Flash, because they worked like just as hard. And you obviously, I needed like Box 2D for. Uh, why are you doing that? That's gonna explode. <coughs> oh, it just broke. Ha <laughs> ha. Perfect. More non-determinism. Yeah, so, but uh, in terms of the physics, is all what's fun instead of what's real. Because fun is more important than real. I have always thought. Counter-Strike is not real. Counter-Strike is fun. Any other questions? You, sir. Um, how long did it take from the time you wrote the note until you released for a while? Like, what was the time? So it was like four months. So it was four months all part-time. Like every waking moment of my part-time, I think a fantastic way to make a good game is to have the most boring job. Because if you, the more boring your job is, the more all this creative energy, you're just sitting at your desk and you're thinking, oh my god, I've got these great ideas and I've got all this creativity and it's going totally unused. And then you get home and you just explode in this world act of making something neat. Have a really bad job is a great way to make a good game. You, sir. <clears throat> I am still amazed the iPhone port worked. I was sure that the iPhone would never work for Fantastic Contraption because of the fat thumb problem. And so I was like, uh, well, there's no way to build a contraption on an iPhone because your finger will always obscure what, uh, what you're going to click on. And so really, just p other people came to me with an interest in making an iPhone, and I was kind of like, all right, I don't think you can do it, but uh, if you really want to try, I guess you can. And then it turns out that the Inexile guy is a guy named... Um, Brian Perfetto wrote <coughs> the iPhone version. I'm a huge fan of his. He wrote this other little game called Shape Shape that's like really fun and you should go like download for two dollars. And he came up with this genius idea that if any if there are any Facebook programmers right now, you should go you should steal and absolutely do. I call it the Perfetto window. But uh, I can't show you. <coughs> but if you put your finger down, and then instead of there's this little window that pops up in like the right hand side that is a zoomed in version of what's going on under your finger, and so you can see it's almost better than the you can almost write it better than the flash version because you always have this little zoomed in window of what's going on, and so I didn't actually know I wanted to do a flash version until somebody wrote it and it worked. Question. Yeah, right. So I, so the question was, uh, how do I, like, I'm going to answer emotionally and technically. Like, how do I emotionally get users to actually pay for something, and how technically do you handle the, like, payment through PayPal? I think your question was the emotional question, but I'm going to answer the technical one, too. All right. So uh, emotionally, I try to be very feel-good. If you go back to the main menu, destroy the contraption you've been working so hard on, <coughs> and then sign out and then do something to make the game reload. So uh, if you see, if you actually mouse over the like full version, you see, see the like, support this game. Support indie game development. That was a big part. I think, th I think that's a big part of why I get actual sales. Yeah, so 
you get some stuff, but see, like, point four is a very important point, because people are playing all these games, and people, like, know that there are human beings behind them making them, and so some, like, 0.5% of people are like, damn it, I just like, I like this game, there's some guy behind it, I'd like to give him some money, and so I think if you, <coughs> I think playing that up is definitely worth it in terms of getting um, turnover and actually getting people to buy your, to, like, stop what they're doing and actually like buy your game and then like i i just want to like say again be a free game not a pay game with like a demo section and then technically if you do if you go through all the work to save stuff on the server then the payment stuff is all easy right because you're doing user management on the server already (coughs) so you can save games to users and so uh, we just throw off to uh, paypal you can send like arbitrary variables to PayPal, so we just send off the user ID. And then whenever uh, people go through the PayPal thing, and then there's this PayPal feature called uh, IPN, called Instant Payment Notification, and it sends your server wherever like you, cho- you just set up like a PHP file, and then it says, all right, uh, this guy with user, your, like, user ID 1234, whatever you set it to, gave you $10 USD, uh, you know, you do what you will with it. And so you just flag his user account, and then every time, <coughs> if you hit, uh, if you hit like, if you actually hit the pay button, you would come back to here, and then that would send a ser- server checkout with the user ID to see if you were actually paid. And it's all like, it's all very easy conceptually, except PayPal is awful, so it's like amazingly hard to find their, like, their sandbox, to even find the sandbox, and then using the sandbox is hard, and there's like, very little code. If you do it, just write me an email and I'll give you my code to do it and you won't have to worry about all that crap. An hour? Yeah, with my code? Yeah, so it's really not that hard. All right, more questions? Come on, someone's got a question. You! Oh, no, well, I've never used it. I know what Unity is. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I uh, I don't know how important the penetration rate of like do you guys do you do you sweat the penetration rate? We lose about fifty percent of our users on the sign page. Fifty percent. That's good for a plugin. So the oh yeah, okay. Yeah, so the flashbang guys say they figure they lose like fifty percent to the like Unity plugin thing. And then uh, I yeah, so when I say flash, like write it in flash, I totally mean flash or unity or just something that you can play online without having to like go through a download. I'm totally into Unity. It's like neat, and the portability is cool. You get iPhone stuff for like free, basically, right? <laughs> Question. How do you determine how much charge people I figured it was like half as good as World of Goo, and World of Goo is twenty dollars. So <laughs> that's the science I put into it, and I have not tested any other price points or moving the paywall back and forth or anything. So I have no hard data on that for you. And no, it doesn't cost nine ninety nine because that's stupid. <laughs> you. Oh, that's a fantastic question. The ad question. All right. Uh, lesson number one: You will never make money on ads. That's not really true. If you have uh, if you have a ton of users, so uh, when contraption started hitting like a million people a month, you can start to make money on ads. But when you're nobody, nobody will pay you any money for ads. Especially, it's got, like gotten worse since last December. There was like a big collapse in the ad market or something. So my suggestion <coughs> is if you're looking to monetize a game, really don't, really don't count on monetizing it through ads. Like, I don't know if you can even pay for bandwidth on ads. They're, don't, don't put them on, because they'll just alienate, like, if they alienate 1% of the people who play the game, then, uh, then... That's like 1% of the people who aren't playing your game who like might have paid. I guess that's, let's see, 1% and then 0.5% of them would have paid for it. So now you're losing, you know, like 0.005% of your actual sales market. Uh, now there's ads on the games after an exile took it because they know ads people and they go to like conferences where ads people are. And so they've got like, there's a guy whose job it is to like do the ad thing. And so they're like way better at it than... Like, anyone in this room is. Anyone in this room will, like, never make a dime off of ads as far as I'm concerned. I'm sure that's, like, wrong and people have, but that's, that's what I've discovered through painful trial. All right, more questions. A couple more questions, I think. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so <coughs> the question was, does box 2D re um, does box 2D behave the same in like on the Flash as well as all the other versions? And so, in fact, box 2D doesn't behave deterministically between a Mac and a PC, which is like bad because if you have a PC. Um, a huge percentage of the, P if you have a Mac, then a huge percentage of the replays saved on PC will just like not work for you, which sucks. And if you have a PC, then a percentage of the replays that saved on Macs will just not work. And that's like, t that's too bad. And then it works, uh, Box 2D is very different um, on an iPhone because there's a lot less um, processor power. So you'll see the iPhone version of Contraption is much squishier. Like, so the squishiness is fun, right? It's like part of contraption, but uh, the iPhone game is way squishier because you just can't run the same number of iterations in the physics. Yeah, between, there's no, we looked at like making um, uh, like replays work between the iPhone and the Flash version. That would have been wicked cool, but there was just, just no way. You'd have to like save the position of all the pieces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is like more work than I was willing to do anyway. Certainly the database barely handles things as is, let alone with saving like replays that are, you know, the position of everything over time. More questions, I demand them. Oh, so the question was, it's, uh, since I like put my blood, sweat, and tears in it, how much have I worked on it since then? Um, so not, like, almost, I wrote probably, like, 10 lines of code after release day. After, like, it was, like, what, July 1st? It was Canada Day. Because <clears throat> I'm Canadian. Yeah, Canada! And so, uh, like, literally, like, 10 lines of code. Now I do uh, design work with an exile. So I don't write any code there, but... I do the fun stuff, right? The stuff that, like, the game's creator, like, oh, does this work, and what are we going to do? We'll get the creator in here, and he'll, like, have all the answers, because magic. Yeah, so really, I was like, I'm really still, like, dead sick of working on Fantastic Contraption. Talking about it is fun, and doing design work on it is fun, but writing code is, like, not so much. Come on, just a couple more. You can do it, crowd. You, sir. <laughs> He'll do it to you, man. Don't wa you watch out. Don't ask that. Qu don't uh, don't tempt him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the question is: Was there like a um, was I mired in a moment of self doubt in uh, during development? And uh, sure, after I wrote the game, after I like finished writing the game, two months in. Because, like, right, you finished, so the, did you see the version, I, you saw the version I sent off to beta testers. That was after, that was two weeks. That was two weeks of development. And that's, like, as far as I'm concerned, that game is done. That game is finished. It's buggy and, like, not that one. <laughs> it's buggy and, like, no one will play it. Not, not that one. Next one. It's buggy and uh, no one will play it but that game is finished. That is a complete game. You can do everything you can do in Fantastic Contraption, like the release version, in this game. It's finished. But then, you know, <coughs> you spend two months actually writing it and making it, like, work with, like, levels and stuff and saving and all that jazz. And that's, you know, kind of fun. And then after, you f after that two months, you then, like, finish the game again. It's spotless. It's fun to play. It's got saving. It's got everything. And now you have to spend two months writing menus? Like, menu writing is not fun. And so it took literally two of my four months of development writing menus, and that was awful. That was all. And you just have to, like, at that point, you're just cruising on belief. It's like, people are going to like and play this game, and the only, like, you need a menu to select levels, so I have to give them that. If people were, if, you know, if everyone here was just happy to run command line level select stuff, we'd have more games, because people would actually finish them. All right, is that it? Do we have time for one more question? All right, you, sir. Uh, speaking about all that, after you finished the game and doing all the stuff that you mentioned, you had to completely redo the tutorial to fit um, yeah. non-gamers. Yeah. How did you go about doing that? Yeah. Like, how much time did you iterate on that tutorial? And was it just a trial by it? Did you just do it once and then you redid it? 
Yeah, that was just this, that was just the second time. It was the first one failed utterly, and then uh, if you watch user testing, what there's some kind of rule that you get 90% of everything you're going to get after five people or something. And so if you just hit, if you watch two or three people try something, the right you know how to do user testing, right? You give people who have never seen your game the game. You say, all right, here's the game. So you're sitting in a chair. Uh, it would be great if you wanted to tell me what you were thinking, but don't feel pressure, and um, like I will be over here and not talk to you. And when they ask you questions, you just say, I don't know. I, it's a good question. I don't know how to start the game. You should, maybe you can figure it out for me. Because you, don't, you just want them to fail like the anonymous user is going to fail. And so after sitting and watching somebody fail like over and over, then you figure out where all your fail points are. And so after you sit like five people through something, you see the like five things that they're all failing on, and then you just need to fix those. And so I was lucky when the second one was like uh, had no major fail points, so it worked fine. It's awful. Like maybe I probably could have made some awesome tutorial that was like took all those fail points out and was still fun for gamers to go through. But instead, I just went through the all right, you idiots, you want to be idiots, then I'll give you the idiot tutorial. <laughs> so the question was how like how often did I design for the idiot? <clears throat> and you know, I think that design, like the simplicity thing, kind of speaks to that. So, like idiots and smart people both like elegance. That's like the overlap. That's where the like Venn diagram of smart people and idiots overlap is like sweet, sweet elegance. And so, I like by designing for simplicity, for like absolute maximum simplicity, you get like idiots for free. Is that it? Are my last words going to be idiots for free? <laughs> All right. Thanks for you very much.